Well, well, well. Good evening. Good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening. I've been doing a lot of thinking lately. I've been thinking about colors and shapes. Colors and shapes make a more definite statement than words. I found that I could say things with colors and shapes that I could not say any other way. Things I have no words for. Oh, words, words. Do you know words and I are not friends? I think we get muddled with words. What about you? We can think about it. Do you see, one day a man came up to me and he said, Oh, you're that uh, Georgia, that woman painter, the one with the bone-littered landscapes. <laughs> yes, isn't that muddled? Well, I took objection to bone-littered landscapes, but I took even greater exception to woman painter. I am a painter, period. Oh, such odd things have been said and done to me with words. Do you know right from the beginning, people have told me not only what to paint, but how to paint it. I am constantly amazed at the spoken and written word telling me what I have painted. <laughs> so, we gather here this evening and who better to tell you the story of how my paintings came to be? Hmm. I'll start at the beginning. I was born November 15th, 1887. My first memory is one of brightness, light. I was outdoors sitting on a quilt. I vividly recall the red stars. I was about seven months old. I wanted to crawl off that quilt and explore the green grass. And so I did. And then suddenly I was unceremoniously picked up and dropped back down on that quilt. Oh, I was annoyed. <laughs> I soon found out through my childhood that life was made up of rules, and it could be so much easier if we simply obeyed the rules. <laughs> no, that's not quite true. If you looked like you were obeying the rules. <laughs> now there's the secret, look like you're obedient and then you can do whatever you damn well please. <laughs> do you know, that was a strategy I used most of my life. I think about my childhood, I remember mother. Ida Toto O'Keefe. She was of Hungarian descent. Her father was Georges Toto, hence Georgia O'Keefe. I was the second of mother's seven children and quite frankly, her least favorite. Yes, that bothered me a bit for a while. And then I realized that being the least favorite well, that allowed me a certain freedom I would never have known otherwise. That too has stayed with me. Mother was a stern woman, but she really enjoyed and encouraged education and reading. She was an avid reader. Every night, she would gather all seven children and read to us. And on wet Sunday afternoons, one of the highlights of my childhood actually, Adventure stories, cowboy and Indian stories about the great far west, riding off into the sunset. Oh, I, I loved those stories. I read those stories for years, and now I live them. <laughs> yes, my childhood. At 12, I was sent off for art lessons. Well, mother was a painter 
and her mother before her. So it was assumed that this daughter would have some kind of talent. Well, it appears that I did. I remember coming home from an art class. I had done a portrait of my Aunt Jenny. I was quite pleased with it and the teacher also. I showed it to mother and she said, nice dear, very nice. I tell you this because a few days later I came back from school and there was mother with my portrait up on her easel. What are you doing, Mama? Just a few minor corrections, dear. Nothing, nothing, just a few. Oh, yes. I ran off to my room, slammed the door. But I realized two things that afternoon. I realized how much painting meant to me. And I realized at age 12 that I was going to be a painter. Two years later, I was 14, I was sent off to Sacred Heart Academy with the Dominican sisters, yes. But you know, those sisters valued art and painting as much as reading, writing, and arithmetic. I obeyed the rules at Sacred Heart. At least I looked like I was. <laughs> and every Sunday we dressed in black, loose black dresses. It was mandatory. And I have to say that I loved it. And to this day, I find black my choice. I dress in black as much as I can. Just the other day, I was walking down the hall and a gentleman stopped me and said, good afternoon, sister. <laughs> I find black anonymous and I can keep all my color for my paintings. I don't have to think about putting it on my body. After Sacred Heart, I went to the local high school. The art teacher, a delightful woman, used to wear a smart little hat covered in purple violets. That I remember, but what I remember most was her teaching. Stop and look, and look at the fine detail. That's what I heard from her. And she brought in living subjects. She brought in a, a jack-in-the-pulpit flower. Do you know that little flower with the little hood on top? Delightful. And she had us examine it and look at it in very minute detail. Do you know that image of that particular flower so stayed with me that 25 years later, 25 years later, I created a series of Jack in the Pulpits based on that image. For several reasons, we had to move. My father was not well. And I was sent to another school, the Chatham Episcopal Institute for Young Ladies. <laughs> yes, indeed. Now that was about rules. I soon learned about rules and working around them. I had learned how to play poker from the hands that worked on the farm. My father and mother ran a dairy farm. So I taught all the girls at the Chatham Institute how to play poker. <laughs> I also learned something else. Mrs. Willis, the principal, was also my art teacher. And she recognized me and she recognized my need for privacy. I found out two things that painting allowed me. It allowed me to acknowledge my need for deep privacy and freedom. And Mrs. Willis would allow me to go into the studio every night after dinner. Yes, I have been fortunate. The following year, I was too young to go to the big city. Mother wouldn't allow it. So I was sent off to relatives in Chicago and studied at the Art Institute of Chicago, working part-time. But 1906, 
I applied to the Art Students League in New York City. And I was accepted. Mother had put aside enough money that we were able to send me. Here I was, the farm girl let loose in the city. You would not have recognized me. During the day, I studied with William Merritt Chase. Oh, astonishing man. He would arrive with his top hat and tails, with his spats and his gloves, to teach his lessons. Every day, a fresh carnation in his lapel. But William Merritt Chase was not only a painter, he was a teacher. And he taught me about filling the space with beauty. In the evenings, I would go out dancing. I was known as the party girl. I know, difficult to believe when you look. Yes. I was another girl then. And I, I wanted to sing. Do you know, I think singing is one of the finest expressions of the human nature. I cannot sing. Not then, not now. But if we believe, and perhaps you do in reincarnation, I should like to come back as a singer, a tall, elegant woman with long, wavy hair who would make such exquisite soprano notes without fear. <laughs> but since I don't sing, I paint. I was fortunate enough to win a scholarship that summer through William Merritt Chase. And I went to study at the summer school at Lake George. Oh, Lake George in the Adirondacks, upper New York State. Do you know this place? <coughs> Exquisitely beautiful. Clean, clear lake. I loved it. But I will tell you that I was not painting. Here I am, the art student with a great mentor, some wonderful friends, in this exquisite place, and I could not paint. Something inside was pulling at me. Was I supposed to recreate the same thing that had been done? Was that what art was all about? I spent my days rowing on the lake until somebody stole the boat. What will you do? You're not painting at all. What are you doing, Georgia? And my friends would ask, and I said, I'm thinking. Do you know this was the beginning of a long road, a curving road over the next eight years? I could not reconcile what I was being taught with what was going on inside my head but I had to make a living. I did not have enough money to return to school that fall, and so I went off working part-time. I did return to my studies. But again, searching, always searching, searching to connect the truth inside. That took several years, and I taught at various places, and the students helped me see, and my teachers helped me see. But 1915 came like a slow boiling pot, and the lid let go. I remember standing in my apartment saying, do you know, everything I have learned, everything I have been taught is of little value to me. Now what? Oh, I had the tools of the trade. I spoke the language of my materials. I knew what to say with pen and ink. I knew what to say with pastel and watercolor. I knew what to say with pencil and paper. But now, how do I say it? What do I say? Oh, such things were whirling and twirling in my head. I'm a practical woman. So when faced with a challenge, I need to find a solution. So do you know what I did? I took out every piece of work that I had done and I put it up all over the apartment, on the walls, up, down, around the apartment. 
And I looked at all these pieces and I could see this one taught me this. Oh, and this school, very definitely that tradition. And over here, oh yes, I recognize him. None of it, my vision, none of it. What did I do? I took a leap. I took a great leap and put everything I had learned aside and I dove in. I dove into my own unknown. It was the most exhilarating time of my life. I would come home at night after teaching, after tramping around the city, after taking my courses, and I would unravel this great roll of manila paper, and I would crouch down on the floor and take out my charcoals, and I decided that I would do with charcoal and only charcoal until I said everything I had to say. Do you know that was October? I didn't introduce color until the following June. I was ecstatic. I was alone and I was free. No one looking over my shoulder telling me how or what to do. Well, I must have turned out two dozen drawings over the next few days. I didn't know what to do with them, so I sent them all off to a friend. She was living in New York at the time. What do I do with these? Am I mad? Am I crazy? Have I completely lost my mind? Leave it with me, she said. And here's what she did. She went off to Alfred Stieglitz at Gallery 291 in New York City and gave them to him. Now, I had heard of Alfred and I knew of the gallery, but I did not know this story. And she went off and brought them to him and apparently Alfred, as so the story goes, undid that role and said, at last, a woman on paper. <laughs> In the meantime, I went back to New York to study at Columbia Teachers College. I had accepted another teaching <clears throat> contract in Texas on condition I take an arts methods course with Arthur Dow. Arthur Dow was an ex excellent teacher. But there I was in the cafeteria one day and I was having my lunch when a young woman waltzed up to me and said, Oh, hello, are you Virginia O'Keefe? No, I said, I'm Georgia O'Keefe. Oh, she said, well, there's a exhibition of drawings at Gallery 291 down on Fifth Avenue. I left her mid-sentence, dropped my lunch, and off I went. Ran down those stairs, got on the tram all the way over to Fifth Avenue, found Gallery 291, up the stairs, and what do you think I saw? There on the walls, every one of my charcoals. I called out, Mr. Stieglitz, uh, Mr. Stieglitz. I was enraged. I was stunned. I was thrilled. <laughs> out from the back room came Alfred Stieglitz with the bushy eyebrows, the bushy mustache, the little round glasses and the brown suit. What can I do for you, miss? I demand that you take these drawings off the wall. Now, why would I do that, miss? Because these are my drawings, and you never asked permission. Well, Miss O'Keefe, how delightful, said Alfred Stieglitz. Those drawings stay on the wall. I need to look at those drawings every day. And Miss O'Keefe, the world needs to look at those drawings. Now, how do you argue with that? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I soon found out that you don't argue with Alfred Stieglitz because you wouldn't, wouldn't ever win. We had a conversation. He invited me to lunch and the drawing stayed on the wall. I came back to that gallery many, many times and continued our friendship with Alfred. But I honored the contract in Texas and went down 
to Canyon, just outside of Amarillo. Well, Texas, I had been through Texas, and Texas with its rugged beauty and its colorful sunsets, and I dove into color. Do you know there was this phenomenon in Texas? Have you noticed this? If you've been, or perhaps elsewhere, there is the evening star that appears, even in broad daylight. How extraordinary is that? I was fascinated with it. So I painted it 10, 15 times. I loved Texas. I went out to the canyons and I did every number of oil and watercolor, at least 50 pieces during that period. I came back, Mrs. Shirley was my <laughs> landlady. Mrs. Shirley, I showed her my latest piece of canyon. I said, Mrs. Shirley, what do you think of this? And she said, what is it? <laughs> and I said, it's, it's a picture of the canyon. It doesn't look like any canyon I know, she said. Well, Mrs. Shirley, I paint how I feel about the place, about a thing. Oh, she said. Well, then you must have had a very bad stomach ache when you were painting that one. <laughs> oh, people have no problem telling me exactly what they think of my paintings. I found that out soon enough. Stieglitz was writing to me every day twice a day, sending me poems and books and articles. And when I got back to New York, he said, I promise you, Miss O'Keefe, your first solo exhibition. And he was good. He kept his word, and in April 1917, I had my first solo show at Gallery 291, all my charcoals and the drawings from Texas. I sold my first piece. It was a charcoal for $200. And Alfred and I, well, Alfred and I became Alfred and I. <laughs> we became closer and moved in together. Now, Alfred was not only a gallery owner, and a promoter of art, but he also was an exceptional photographer. And over the next few years, he took hundreds of photographs of me, many of them in the nude. And he decided that, oh, it must have been 1921, he was going to do a retrospective of all his work. So he put together a show of 100 pieces, 45 of them were of me. He didn't ask me which ones he would put up, nor did he inform me. So when I arrived at opening night for the show, the entire room burst into applause. <laughs> there on the walls were my photographs in the nude. I was embarrassed. Take them down, Alfred. Take them down. New York is seeing far too much of Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> it is art, my love, it is art. We've had this conversation in any event, he added. <laughs> so I continued to paint, and I was in love. And every summer we would go back to Lake George because the Stieglitz family had their summer home, Oaklawn, at Lake George. And I looked at the flowers and the trees and the leaves and the water in a whole new light. And I painted these exquisite forms in nature. And I painted them big. I wanted them big so that people would stop and see and truly see the detail of a flower, the exquisite coloring. Even New Yorkers would stop and see. <coughs> Alfred put together an exhibition of my work, including the flowers, a lot of the elements of nature. I had vegetables and plants. And the critics, do you know how it was received? 
Everyone, all the critics, saw one thing in those paintings. Sex. Sex! In my flowers. <laughs> Loud, tumultuous, tumescent sex. Oh, I was... I was outraged. I argued, I explained, I discussed. These are elements of nature. My colors are genderless. Oh, to no avail. No one wanted to listen to that. Stieglitz dismissed the whole thing. He said, oh, it's a, it's a reflection of the time, my love. Freud had just published his theory on sex. D.H. Lawrence had just put out his smash hit, Lady Chatterley's Lover. So the country was buzzing with sex. So why not see sex in my flowers? Oh, I was upset. And the critics put me in that category of woman painter. Separate and distinct, you see, from the men. A different subspecies, so to speak. There was one, Waldo Frank. He was a friend, an artist, and a critic. And he came forward and said something I totally valued. Look to Miss O'Keefe's Simple monosyllabic speech. Oh, I like that. He got the simplicity. But do you know he ruined it all a little while later when he called me the great American peasant? <laughs> do you know I was misunderstood? I was misunderstood. People had an image of me, the public, critics, dealers, that I was some ethereal being, living up in the sky, taking clouds for nourishment. Well, here's the truth. I like beefsteak. <laughs> and I like it rare. But I would be lying to you if I told you that the words did not affect me. And so I pulled back. I pulled back a little further, but Alfred and I drew closer to a point where in December 1924, he came to me and said, Miss O'Keefe, I think it's time we should make it legal. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, indeed. So off we went on December 11th. He was 60 years old and I was 38. We went off to New Jersey, no fanfare, no hoo-ha, no rings. There was no honor and obey in that service. <laughs> and I stuck to my name. My name is Georgia O'Keefe, and I'll hang on to that even with my teeth. A few months later, we moved into the Shelton Hotel at Lexington and 49th. It was that new high rise. We were up on the 30th floor, 3003, corner unit. I loved it. We had the north facing windows for the light and the east facing for the Hudson River. Fabulous views. And I felt at home. I had a new studio in the air. People couldn't understand it. What are you doing up there? You're no bird. But I loved it. I looked out that window and I could see the world in a whole new way. And I painted the skyscrapers and I painted them at night and during the day. And I painted them with the sun reflecting off the window. Well, the walls in the place were stark. They were dove gray and white. I like the simplicity of white. Well, it was so basic, I had a friend come over, very few of them came to the apartment. I had a friend come over and say, why, Georgia, the place has the air of a reception room at an old orphanage. <laughs> it was my studio. It's how I do my best thinking, if what you call what I do thinking. Well, Alfred put together a, a show, 1927. 
We sold several paintings in the first day and made $17,000. And I tell you this to show you the balance. Ten years earlier, in 1917, I had to borrow $1,000 so I could live in New York for one year. And then one day, Alfred came home and said, there's good news. A Frenchman wants to buy your calla lily panels, all six of them, for $25,000. He came into the gallery, he said. I did not like the man, so I threw out a number, 25000 and he said yes. Well, I had to sell them to him, didn't I? <laughs> and he said, you can have them on two conditions, that you never sell the paintings, and that you never exhibit them beyond your home. He agreed. The New York Times got wind of this sale and out they came to interview me, this young reporter. First thing he said was, Ms. O'Keefe, what is it like to be an overnight success? <laughs> yes, sit down, I said. I'll tell you about overnight. If you mean by overnight, an artist who starts at age 8, 10, 12, and who toils and labors for years, struggling often to meet ends meet, if you mean by that, that is success, is that what you mean? Well, by now the reporter was starting to back out of the apartment. <laughs> there was always a debate. There was always an issue. And Alfred came back and said to me, you know that Frenchman? Yes, I said, with the calla lily panels. It was a hoax, he said. I made that up. It's a promotional device. Oh, I said. You made up the whole thing? Yes, it's just a story, my dear. It's just the way the world works. Well, I kept on painting, but the winds of change were blowing. They were blowing indeed. 1929, a difficult year for very, very many. And a friend, Rebecca Strand, said to me, Georgia, we need to get away. You need to get away. Come with me. We'll drive down to New Mexico, Santa Fe. Have you been to Santa Fe? Yes. yes. Ah, you know. I had never been. I did not know what to expect. Oh, I had been through Santa Fe briefly on my way up to New York one time. But this was out in the desert, 7,000 feet of elevation. I felt like I had developed telescopic vision. I could see for miles. Those sweet red hills, those great stark mountains, and that smell, that smell of sage everywhere, and the light. Our friend Mabel Dodge Luhan invited us to Taos to stay at her home. And so we went out to Taos, and you know, every night after dinner, I would borrow her white mare, and I would ride out to those hills. And I would get off the horse and climb up the hills, and I would watch this sunset, this show. And never have I experienced such a deep, deep peace of the earth. And then you would look up into that sky, that that tapestry of stars. Do you know one summer, I remember climbing a hill and I looked out and I counted 10, 12 thunderstorms ripping across the sky all at once. It was spectacular. No, something came alive in me in New Mexico. Something ended and something came alive. And things just kept getting more interesting. Alfred, 
Alfred wired me and said, another painting has been sold for $6,000. What do I do with that? You send me the money, I said. <laughs> I had a list of things I wanted. And do you know what topped that list? Well, some of you are interested in cars. I wanted a Model A automobile. Model A Ford, 1929. Shiny black on the outside. Blue interior with large windows, a great steering wheel. I loved it. I named that car. I called her Hello. <laughs> I didn't know how to drive her. So the first thing I had to do was learn how to drive that car. Mabel Dodge's husband volunteered, and that was something he lived to regret. Oh, I became known as the demon driver. I would go out on those abandoned roads up over bridges and near precipices. And eventually, eventually we made our way out over a ridge. And we stopped and looked into a deep valley. And I said, what is this? And he said, that is Ghost Ranch. Ghost Ranch. And do you know when you know, when you look at something, a place, when you look at a person and you know? I looked at Ghost Ranch and knew that was my home. Not right there and then, but I knew it would be my home. And that's how I spent that first summer in New Mexico. Oh, driving around in hello riding the horse, painting every day. And then there was Stieglitz. Stieglitz was getting more and more afraid. Afraid that my infatuation, he called it, my infatuation would be stronger than my loyalty to him. So I returned to New York. But all that winter and spring, now in my head was that sun, that sand, and those mountains. In 1930, I came back to New Mexico, and I call it the summer of the bones. Look, look what I have brought here. These exquisite creatures. Are they not wonderful? I would go out on the desert every day walking, and I would gather these magnificent sun-bleached pieces, just sitting there waiting, and I would bring them home. Do you know, I did not know how to paint the desert until I saw the bones, and then I knew. People looked at me and said, Georgia, they remind me of death, but to me, they remind me of life. They are a most living thing. Oh, look here. The pelvic bones. Oh, I started to see the world in a whole new way. I started to see the world through the holes in the bones. And I saw that contrast of white bone against that blue sky, that blue, blue sky that will be forever thus, despite all our own destructiveness. Do you know, when I was a child, I was the type of child who ate the raisin last in the cookie. I kept the donut whole till the end, and it is the same now. I have not changed much. I still love the holes in the bones. Well, I couldn't very well leave them, could I? So I gathered them up, brought them back to the ranch, and I packed them into a wooden barrel carefully, and I sent them all off to New York to himself. You can imagine how that was received. Sixteen dollars for a barrel of old bones. I brought the bones back to the apartment. I brought the bones out to the summer home, and I painted the bones against the sky. I painted the bones against the sand with flowers in the moonlight. 
and Alfred became still more afraid, more fearful of my widening gap, he said, between New York and New Mexico. He was afraid of my driving. He was afraid of my friends in New Mexico. He was afraid that we were getting and growing further and further apart. Come to New Mexico, I insisted. You come down, Alfred. You would love the heat. No, he said. My world is here in New York and Lake George. And so I split my world. The winters I spent with him. And in the summers, I went back to New Mexico. Except in 1932. 1932, the Museum of Modern Art asked 65 artists to paint a variety of pieces, murals really, for their new building. Well, I got involved in that. We had six weeks to complete the task and I was pleased with my piece. It was a nightscape with a little fantasy thrown in of roses, roses drifting into the night sky. Well, the entire show was panned. It was most disheartening. I had a young friend named George Engelhart who said, it's time for you to take a trip. Ah, oh, I said, but a new trip. Young Georgia, she was called, and you know if she's called Young Georgia what they called me. <laughs> young Georgia and I set off in a car up to Canada. We came up to Quebec, to the eastern townships, and I painted every day that exquisite landscape of rolling hills of farmhouses. Oh, we ate and laughed our way, had a few drinks too. I didn't speak a word of French. Everyone spoke French. It was perfect. <laughs> I didn't have to talk to anyone. <laughs> we made our way out to the Gaspé Peninsula. And I love that rock face jutting out of the water. And we painted every day. I felt alive. It was time to come home in the fall of 1932. And I, I came through a difficult, difficult door. Alfred, it would seem, his heart, his interests were elsewhere. And so I was asked by Donald Desky to paint the mezzanine powder room at Radio City Music Hall. I accepted. It was a job. It was a commission. I had no idea how large an undertaking, how big the job was. It was a huge room with circular ceilings. And I was not feeling my strongest. I worked on it night and day, right through the weekends. And in November, he asked me to come and see the building, to see my room. There had been a problem with the heat. The heating system had over, overheated and every piece of fabric, every cloth, every piece I had worked on was coming off the walls. All of it, just coming down around my head. It was as if my world were collapsing. I, um, I burst into tears and had to leave the room. I went off to Lake George to recover. Alfred Stieglitz called Desky and said, Georgia's having a nervous breakdown. But the doctor said, hmm, early menopause perhaps. Maybe it's her kidneys. But it was Marjorie Content, my friend, who said, no, it is your heart, isn't it, Georgia? It is your heart, and it's called a broken heart. And with that, I was hospitalized for two months. I would not see Stieglitz. And when I was discharged, Marjorie brought me to Bermuda, to the sun, to the heat, to the sand, and as slowly, slowly, the strength returned to me. Slowly, slowly, I 
came back to me. And I remember walking down the streets of New York again. You know after you've been ill and you come back into the world, it's as if you're a new person, that you've been born again. And I walked down the street knowing, knowing that I was alive. But I also knew that I would return to the Southwest. And so did Stieglitz. You see, I needed, I needed the sun. I needed the heat. I needed to laugh again. I needed to be loved. <laughs> By 1934, I was well enough. I had hello too now. <laughs> and I could drive down to New Mexico. And do you remember that ghost ranch I saw and I knew would be my home? Well, I found my way there. It was a dude ranch, 22,000 acres owned by a man named Arthur Pack. And I arrived unannounced and he said, what are your chances? We just had a cancellation. I moved into a bungalow and I stayed for four months. Every day I would go out either tramping along those paths or out in the wilderness and often I would take the car. Oh, I got very clever. I turned that little car into a mobile studio. Listen to this. I took out the passenger seat, unbolted the driver's seat, and I turned it around and faced that back seat, put the 30 by 40 inch canvases. It was perfect. I would set out early in the morning before the heat of the day, and I would paint those hills, those glorious hills. Sometimes they looked angry blood red when the clouds would come over them. But at other times they were soft and fleshy pink. Oh, I know not everyone feels the same about those red hills, nor should you. But to me, they are home. You know, I even had fantasies about lying naked in those hills. <laughs> At night, I would return, have a light meal, and then stroll, take a walk out in the sunset, in this magnificent, fierce light that lit the world. Do you know I would climb some of those hills and feel like no one else in the world had ever been there before me? In 1937, Arthur Pack showed me his own home on the ranch. He said he had to sell it. And again, I crossed a threshold and I walked into that adobe ranch and I knew. I want your home, Arthur. Well, let's just look at it first, Georgia. I want your home. How much do you want for it? You know when you know? I say grab it. I say I don't understand when people see something that they love and they don't just grab it. Well, I grabbed it. This home, this adobe house with the great central courtyard and at the front door, the view was of the Pedernal. The Pedernal is an exquisite mountain 10 miles to the south and it is a high flat top massa with flint deposits where the Indians go and make their arrowheads. But it is also the place where they say that changing woman lives. How appropriate is that? <laughs> the best view, you take the ladder up to the roof. And there you have 360 degrees of wonder. I've spent more summer nights up on that roof gazing at those stars, those wondrous stars. And I would watch the moon travel across, shifting the light onto those hills. That's how I spent my life, painting there in the summer, filling up the car and going back to New York, and Stieglitz would put on an exhibition of my new paintings. <coughs> Except in 43, do you know I studied at the Art Institute of Chicago as a young 17-year-old. And now, what, 35, 40 years later, they asked me 
to organize a retrospective. 67 pieces of my work. The Museum of Modern Art celebrated me that same year. I was thrilled. Stieglitz, Stieglitz felt abandoned. He had always been the manager, the organizer, but his own health was failing. By 1946, he had a cerebral hemorrhage and he fell into a coma and died July 13th. Do you know I love that man? Oh, despite all the contradictory nonsense we put up with. Do you know what we had at our center was good and clear and good. Yes, good. It took me three years to organize his estate. Thousands of pieces of art, thousands of photographs. And yet, in 1949, I closed up the apartment in New York and went down to New Mexico permanently. Now, I told you about the ranch at Ghost Ranch. I told you about the adobe house. But one of the problems was the ground. I could not have a garden. And I wanted to grow my own vegetables and flowers. So one day I was walking out near the town of Abiquiu. It's about 16 miles south of Ghost Ranch. And up on a hill, I came across the most delightful adobe home. Well, it was in a bit of a shambles, but no matter. Attached to it was the most exquisite, overgrown garden. Who owns this? I found out the Catholic Church owned it and rented it out as a shed to farmers, and they kept their cattle in it. But I could see beyond it, and when I tramped through the ruins of the place, I could see within the courtyard there was a long wall with a great door in the middle. Do you know I bought that place, not only for the garden, but for that door in the middle. I tried to paint that door so often I could never get it. It is still to this day a challenge to get that door. Renovation started. I brought in large plate glass. And do you know from my studio or from the bedroom, I could sit, I could stand, or I could lie down and see those rolling hills. I could see the Chama River Valley. And that is how I spend my life. I spend my winters at Ghost Ranch and my summers at Abiquiu in the garden. I have become passionate about this garden. I grow flowers and vegetables, every manner of fruit tree, and we've had problems with grasshoppers. But I brought in turkeys and that take, took care of it instantly. <laughs> my sister Claudia even visits. She likes to work the land with her hands. But largely, I am alone, very few visitors, although I do have my Siamese cats, Annie and Aloysius. And then the dogs came, Chinese chows, you know those great fuzzy dogs? Well, they are quite devoted to me, and I'll confess I to them. They come out with me on our great walks, and I'm not a joiner, you might have guessed that of me but I joined the International Chow Society. <laughs> oh, the villagers dislike the dogs, especially the local priest. He thinks they're vicious monsters, but then they're not particularly fond of him either. <laughs> and that is how I spend my life, walking and painting and gardening and traveling now. But you know, when all is said and done, where I was born and where I have lived is really of little importance. It is what I have done with where I have been that should be of interest. Where there were flowers that I liked, I picked them and brought them home. And where there were rocks and bones and stones that I liked, 
I picked up the rocks and bones and stones and brought them home. All these things I have used to say what is to me the wideness and the wonder of the world as I live in it. Yes, I have been terrified every moment of my life but I've never let it stop me doing a single thing I wanted to do. And with that, I wish you all a good night. Introduce Pearl. This is Pearl, <laughs> and she was a horse. Is a horse um, from Salt Spring Island, and I've become very fond of Pearl. And so I introduce her now. It shows she's quite special and on loan uh, from uh, one of the farms there. But I would like to ask um, also. I'd like to share with you that Georgia O'Keeffe was quite a remarkable humanitarian in her own way. And she would not have shared this in the story, but I, Margaret, will. Not only did she buy the water rights for her own home, but she bought the water rights for every uh, home in that village. She also built the school and the roads and the community center and sent many of the students, the children, off to further education. And I wanted you to know that. So, is there a question or something about Georgia or the process that you would be interested in asking? Yes. Did she sell very well her canvases and her art while she lived? Did she sell very well is the question. She did indeed. She was stunned that she could command. And I think in 1927 when she sold three for 17,000, um, that was a considerable amount, especially when you think that 10 years earlier it took her $1,000 to live in New York. And Noel pointed out that in 2014, the Jimson weed, which is a flower that grows wild, particularly in New Mexico, and she loved it, was sold for $44 million at Sotheby's. Yeah, like it's astonishing. She didn't know those numbers, but she was a very wealthy woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. why you chose um, Georgia. Uh, the question is, I'm curious why I chose Georgia. And often in my stories, the women choose me. And I, for years, said I would not share other than Canadian women's stories. But that changed with um, the story of Cicely Saunders, the founder of the Modern Hospice. And I was traveling to Tacoma, Washington, and uh, sharing the story of Georgia. Um, of uh, Cicely Saunders, and there was an exhibition of Georgia O'Keeffe. And I said to Noel, she's the next story. It was a bell ringing inside. And we went down to New Mexico and stood in her home and walked her path. And it was an extraordinary journey. Yes. Thank you. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sure. Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, you really brought Georgia O'Keeffe into, into the room. Thank you. Uh, do you get to feel like her when you're doing this? Do you um, obviously study her. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, um, you brought George O'Keefe into the room. Do you get to feel like her? I stand back here, and especially when I was at Ghost Ranch walking around, because you always wonder, you know, when she's saying, I don't know, I've got all this teaching outside, but there's my own truth. And I remember saying, is this OK? Do you give me permission? And I felt yes. Yeah. So yes, I do feel her walking with me. Beautiful.